and we're live. This is Plant Daddy Podcast, serving you intersectional horticulture. I'm Matthew. And I'm Stephen. Hey, welcome back to Plant Daddy Podcast. Uh, So today we have a really great interview lined up that I am personally really excited about. The person that we are chatting with is one of my own personal horticulture heroes. So I am recovering from laryngitis. I have been trying to get better at talking like a normal person for the last few days. doing so well. Thank you. Uh, So Stephen, how was your Thanksgiving? Mine was great. Uh, I spent it with my family about a half hour away from where I live, so it was convenient. Oh, that's uh, really nice. good, yeah, really good food. A friend came, so it was sort of a small affair, but uh, yeah, really nice. How was yours, Matthew? It was good. Um, we did the trek to Brian's family, spent it with uh, his parents and some of their uh, family friends, and then we went to spend it with Bine on the Friday. Mm-hmm. So we drug one of our buddies with us, and basically he just went to all the thanksgivings that we did (laughs) and yeah it was a lot of people but it was really fun and very cool man i was glad to have a couple of days just to rest up and recover afterwards though because it was a lot yeah i mean but sounds good there's friends um family chosen family yeah all there yeah you know and thanksgiving is all about friends and the people who are important so it was a really great way to spend the time with those people um, cool. Any but, plant updates for you? Yeah. So I was actually getting really excited about this plant uh, before I knew that I had a cutting on my way. But Miles has Syngonium chiapens, which is a species of arrowhead vine that's native to Mexico. Hmm. And it doesn't look like a lot of the species or cultivars that you're probably picturing that have those like namesake arrowhead shaped leaves. Okay. Instead, they're almost heart shaped. They're quite large. Like these are the largest leaves I've seen on any Syngonium. Uh, personally, I know that some also get large, but these are the biggest that I've seen. And they're deep, deep, rich, emerald green. And he just texted me one evening and was like, hey, do you want a cutting of this? I'll trade you for one of your pinicula. Oh, wow. So great. I gave him pinicula Weezer. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I've had such great luck with it, and he doesn't really discriminate based on flower color the way that I do. So (laughs) he now has one of those amazing, robust-growing, neon pink flowering plants. And I have Syngonium chiapens, which I'm now rooting. It is a one-leaf cutting with another leaf emerging, and I'm hoping it does well because it's really gorgeous, and I want to train it up a little pole so that it can show off its amazing potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's already a picture on Instagram if you're curious. Um, Yeah. Just, yeah, maybe go back a day or two. It's in one of my little self-watering vessels that I've been making out of wine bottles. Yeah. We drink, you know, enough wine that we always have a lot of bottles lying around. one day worth of bottles for you, right? Uh, Yeah, but Brian drinks more wine than I do. (laughs) Okay, no, he said yes, that was not, it's not one day. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So I've been cutting them in half with a like glass cutter that you can get in any craft store pretty much and mm-hmm. then just sanding the edges carefully so that there are no sharp you know parts that you can cut yourself on obviously and then you take a wicking cord and i kind of cut a long loop of it tie a couple of of knots in the middle and then i string it through so that the two loose ends are going down the neck of the bottle And then that loose loop up above is among the substrate that I put in there. And this way, the water reservoir, which is the lower half of the wine bottle into which the upper half has been inverted, uh, that water reservoir just pulls the water up the wick, keeps the substrate nice and moist, but without ever getting soggy. So I've been doing a lot of plants like ferns and uh, various aeroids and some cuttings just to see how that goes. And honestly, it's doing really well. I had some uh, philodendron mecans, which is actually heterasifolia. Mm-hmm. Um, but that one, the roots are growing down into the reservoir now, and it's really cool to watch. So I've been having a lot of fun with that particular method and trying out all different things. How about you? Um, so for me, uh, recently I brought in a tree I really like. Uh, I have a small cabbage tree. So this is kind of a strange species. It's Dendroceris literalis. 
and it's from the Juan Fernandez Islands in Chile. So oh, it's kind of okay. way out, you know, way out in the Pacific. There's a couple of these, you know, little isolated ecosystems. And this is one of those stories, you know, that like there were explorers, they dropped off a goat. There were, you know, this is the only place these uh, trees were found. Kind of one of those stories where I think in the 80s there were only a couple trees left. And these have slowly been working their way kind of into cultivation. I got one a year or two ago. Um, felt super special. You couldn't find them online then. Where did you uh, find it? So I got it through a friend who has been a botany student and just is really well connected to the community here. Okay. Um, he had a grower who grew them from seed. Apparently they're fairly easy to grow from seed. Um, and luckily, like if you are curious about this plant, you can now get seeds online. Uh, I think fairly easily. I feel like I might have seen it on Logi's website, but it might be something I different. See, they're different cabbage trees. Oh, okay. Um, but this one has a really dramatic uh, orange, like large orange flower. Um, oh, okay. And there's a, a rare hummingbird that feeds almost exclusively on these. Just kind of a cool story, a cool plant story, I oh, think. Oh, that's cool. What's the scientific name again? Dendroceris literalis. Oh, okay. The one that Logis has is Bringhamia in Cygnus. So, okay. no, not the same plant. But this is, that one is native to Hawaii. So, right. it is another rare and endangered species that I know that you can find. But I didn't realize there were multiple cabbage trees. Yeah. So, so this one, it's a unique look. It's edible, which I think is interesting. Um, I mean, cabbage is edible. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, if you're hungry, right, in a pinch, you can just go on your balcony. Okay, um, I'll just snack on it while we're sitting here. Yeah, but we had some uh, some chilly nights, so I brought it in, kind of gave it some TLC, and I thought the soil wasn't that great that I had it planted in this past year. So I changed that up a little bit, and it's looking good. What um, was the soil before, and what is it now? So before I had, I was using a much denser, richer soil that mm -hmm. I thought I had cut enough with you know, just various things like perlite and pumice. And um, I used some other soil. I thought I had cut it enough. And I was like, oh, I'm going to try to really pump this up, make the soil more rich. I knew the plant was okay with like slightly wetter conditions. Yeah. And it was okay, but it just didn't grow as robustly as it should have over the summer. So I put it in something a bit airier again and, you know, worried less about making it super rich um, and re nutritious. But yeah, I think it's already kind of responding to the heat inside yeah. and looking good. I definitely noticed it as soon as I walked in. Yeah. So that's probably my big plant news. Otherwise, just making room for a ton of cuttings that I've been rooting over the past few weeks, hoping those all take. And it looks like it's touch and go for some. So my oh. fingers are crossed. Yeah. Well, it's not always 100% success. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's about all for plant updates for me. Um, okay. Should we get to the good stuff? Yeah. Before we dive into our interview, I just want to remind everyone that we can be found on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest as Plant Daddy Podcast and online at plantdaddypodcast.com. You can also contact us by email at plantdaddypodcast at gmail.com. And we would love it if you could take a minute to go to your podcast provider of choice to rate and subscribe us and recommend us to friends because that is how podcasts grow and then we can continue to provide great content for you. One piece of great content that I want to give a shout out is that we have been getting a lot of listener questions. So one thing that we've been doing with those, because typically it's a question that a lot of people might have and a lot of people could benefit from the response, we've started putting those on our website. So there's only a couple right now, but this is a good way for you to either check out some FAQs or you know, just write in and ask your own question. Maybe you'll show up there. Okay, so before we start the interview, I just want to pat myself on the back because I did not completely get all excited chatting with one of my horticulture heroes. Yes, okay, let me say, you guys, the restraint was incredible. I'm so proud, um, and I think it was a really great chat. But without much ado, here is Mr. Plant Geek, Michael Perry. All right, so we've got Michael Perry with us today, and I assume most of us are familiar with him from his online presence as Mr. Plant Geek, and he's a popular guest on all plant-related platforms. But in case you've somehow missed those, I just want to share a little bit about his bio in enough detail that he'll be forced to share all new content with us. Okay, 
So from a young age, Michael was inspired by horticulture, beginning with his grandparents, and they were growing really spectacular chrysanthemums and dahlias, which eventually led him to run his own mail order herb nursery as a teenager. Shortly thereafter, he began working for the UK mail order plant company, Thompson and Morgan, after entering <laughs> one of their garden design competitions. And soon after that, he was working for them as a plant hunter to source unique plants. And these were either new or rediscovered ones and adding them to their catalog. So since then, he has been working in plant development and marketing and introduced hundreds of new plants in the UK, like the eggs and chips and the ketchup and fries plants, which grow potatoes below the soil and either eggplants or tomatoes above, and also creating a market for existing plants like the fuchsia berry, which is a typical flowering ornamental fuchsia, but with the addition that it produces a reliable and sizable crop of exotic edible fruit. His appearance on QVC across Europe, BBC, and ITV, as well as his strong social media presence, have really done a lot to promote gardening for mental health and well-being. And he has worked pretty hard at promoting gender equality among plant hobbyists. He's basically always on the go traveling for work and plants. So we're really thrilled to have found a time to talk with Michael while he's in China. So, Michael, hello from Seattle. Hey, morning, evening. What a great introduction. Yeah. You got everything <laughs> correct. You really did your research well. Yeah, but I think we I have you cornered now. <laughs> yeah, I, I've personally been following you for years on social yeah, media, and, uh, and you've been a, uh, a, a big influence I, in my own personal urban gardening exploits. Yeah, so. oh, good. <laughs> yeah, so um, to start us off here, mm. uh, we know you travel a lot, but what, what are some plants do you have now? What plants do I have now? Yeah, because you're traveling a lot. It might be hard mm. to take care for. Are there any that you uh, still have? Well, do you know what? It's, my, life has been, uh, my life has been so crazy for the last four years because, you know, you previously documented my work with Thompson & Morgan, which is the company I worked for for 18 years since I left school. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to freelance and the freelance world kind of opened up sort of global travel. And so... I have not had my own garden for about five years and I feel so itchy about <laughs> that. But at the same time, my career has been taking me kind of wildly to different places. It also coincided with my relationship with a guy that has been living in New York, now in China as well. So I've kind of, I wouldn't like to say I've been following him around the world because we don't want to give him that compliment, but kind of <laughs> obviously kind of his work has been in different places. My work is often quite remote. So that means that I've then done my work from his location, but also picked up extra work. For example, when I was working on HSN in the US. So it's kind of become this crazy kind of global life that I didn't even foresee. And so in China now, we've been in this apartment for a year and a half and I, I try oh, and be wow. here as much as possible. So probably about a third of the year. So probably not that much to some people, but, you know, our relationship's always been quite transient in that way anyway. But here I would say I'm kind of just looking around. I've got probably about 20 houseplants. Okay. And, and I've got to say, Rafael, my partner, is not a houseplant. He's not into plants at all. He's a tech geek. But he's looked <laughs> after these plants pretty well. And so I'm quite impressed. So we've got kind of 20 kind of houseplants that are here all the time. But I also... I know I'm on video here, but not on the podcast, but I'll show you guys. I do lots of these crazy kind of like, you know, water propagations everywhere. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's like just having loads of little bunches of flowers around the house as well. So every little corner has got a little jar of pothos or like cut stems of some leafy plant. But I yeah. do have the most amazing fiddle leaf fig, which I called Francesca. Oh, and that okay. is doing, <laughs> it's doing really well. and. Yeah, so we've got Francesca the fiddle leaf fig, but it blows my mind when I walk around the local neighborhood and I see that fiddle leaf figs are just growing in the shrub, in the scrub, you know, just in the borders, kind of almost as a wild plant. So wow. here you can either buy your house plants at the shop or you can just go and pick cuttings off all the plants, you know, just in the local neighborhood instead. It's just it's just crazy. And oh, you know, so often there. we we would go to Hong Kong and kind of visit one of the islands. And this is where, you know, Pophos and Philodendron, they're just growing wild. And it's wow. just, it kind of just blows your mind when you're, when you're coming from a cooler Northern European environment where it's a struggle to grow some of these plants. Here, they can't get rid of them because they're like weeds, you know? It's crazy. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> okay, so you live inside oh. of a greenhouse. 
it sounds like, basically. <laughs> mm, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you could stay in one place, what would your dream garden or dream plant space be like? Mm. I would say not necessarily England, <laughs> because mm. the climate is a little bit too restrictive, really. I mean, it's never warm enough to grow anything in the summer that I love. So a lot of the kind of more tropical plants, you know, it's also very hard even to get bedding plants to kind of really get that size on them because you need the warmth, the humidity, you yeah. know, to help them along. And also the light levels. We don't have the light levels for a lot of cool plants. So I wouldn't say England. So sorry about that. Um, maybe I'm always my heritage is from Greece. So I'm always very drawn to Greece. But then as an environment to grow plants in, that's kind of incredibly dry. Mm -hmm. um, when I then look at a tropical area like this, it's almost like too humid. So you almost can't spend time outside when it is the height of the summer. So what is that perfect climate to grow in? I'm not actually sure how to answer that question. Um, yeah, probably a shady area in a tropical country. And then you can have all your tropical plants around you, get that vibe. I've always been obsessed with unusual edibles as well. So like, you know, a tropical fruit orchard. Wouldn't that be incredible? You know, oh, yeah. we yeah. just had a holiday in the Seychelles and like just by the by the little hut, the hotel room was, you know, a mango tree just casually just sitting there producing mangoes. It's the same as, you know, me growing up with an apple tree. It's like just it kind of blows your mind, the things that you're not used to sometimes. And then when you're suddenly in front of them, it's like, oh, wow, that is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any specific plants that you would like definitely include in those tropical gardens? Mm. It sounds like fruiting trees, maybe. Mm. Sorry, I'm eating a pretzel at the same time. So sorry. <laughs> We're getting pretzel. pretzels here too, so yeah, we can't we can't judge. Yeah, but your pretzels are evening snacks. Mine is a breakfast delivery that I just got from a local German bakery, so. <laughs> well, I am about a quarter German, so I support that. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so what would be my favorite tropical plants? I'm always really drawn to passion flowers and kind of all the different types that you've got there. I've worked on introducing a few in the past as well. The People underestimate the perfume of passion flowers too. Yeah. And even in a Northern Europe environment, you can grow... Passiflora cerulea, um, also perfume passion is a very nice one. It's just kind of borderline hardy, has a really nice fragrance as well. And then kind of considering how vast that whole genus is, you know, right down to citrina, which is the tiny yellow bloom, mm -hmm. through to something that gives the big fruit and the big flowers like quadrangularis. There's even ones that have got a tree habit rather than a climbing habit as well. So Passion flowers quite high up on my list. I've also always been obsessed. For some reason, I have a tattoo on my arm of this plant, which is Etlingera, which is the torch huh. ginger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool plant, and they use it um, in some types of sambal in Indonesia. But it's one of those weird plants that kind of throws up loads of big stems, like a strelitzia. And then these flowers are kind of just gently hidden, just a foot off the ground, down in the kind of mm. crown of the foliage. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of crazy plant. But when you get up close to the blooms, they're kind of waxy. They're kind of this really clear, sexy red color as well. Yeah. So that I often kind of class as being one of my favorite plants for some reason. But I find it hard when someone says, what is your favorite plant? Because we don't know. It changes all the time. So I almost like yeah. it's really crazy because I kind of almost have to rehearse my answer so if somebody asked me kind of in a kind of tropical theme i'm like etlingera if someone asked me like and i'm in england or northern europe then i'll usually say an iris <laughs> oh so yeah i've got it you just point to, already, a, so. point to a different tattoo right yeah i know <laughs> so. <laughs> the illustrated botanist <laughs> uh, okay you don't you know what it just happened the tattoos it's not like i ever set out to have botanical tattoos and and it's strange that I now realize not many people have so many botanical tattoos. So, yeah, it's become almost my um, my USP without without knowing. So that's pretty neat. Mm. So if someone has a unique plant, maybe something with unexpected um, variegated or pink growth, maybe what should mm -hmm. they do? 
or how would they know if it's truly unique or not? This is something that you were doing in your past, right? Yeah. So when I was working at Thompson and Morgan, right from even the first week, we were out there on the road looking for new plants. So, I mean, a couple of occasions would be relating it to garden plants would be delphiniums. So mm -hmm. we, we had a phone call and there's a nursery in London that said we've got a delphinium that has black speckles on the flower. So we drove down straight away and we collected the plant. Obviously, you have to have the original plant with this type of thing. You can't save the seed because you're not sure if it's going to come true or not. And right. another time yeah. we also picked up a, a petunia that had a star shaped flower rather than a standard size flower. So that was pretty unique. Um, but yeah, variegation obviously can occur through being a sport so that would be kind of occurring kind of naturally but just kind of by chance so you might be able to then propagate that depending on what the plant is or sometimes it could be through mutation as well which again can be uh what do you call it like propagated and live on but it's kind of like the plant because it lacks chlorophyll it's always going to be a little bit weaker than you yeah. know a green plant of that type so it's really kind of take a chance and see if it happens. But I've seen some crazy stuff where they've actually initiated the variegation in plants. And there's there's one particular plant, um, I think it's Portulaca af afra, and they actually give it radiation to give little pink tips to the, to the leaves. Hmm. And that's kind of, I can't decide if that is cool or really awful. But it gives you a plant that looks very different, but is actually from that point slowly dying. So, no, actually, that is awful. If I call that cool, then I'll, yeah, I'll get call out, called out for that. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so, that's a plant that if you get it with those pink tips, they'll either go away or the plant will die. What do you think the longevity of that as a plant would be? Well, I've grown one and not long. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. Because, I mean, um, you can obviously, you know, for people that are trying to find out if that is actually an unusual plant or not, you can always look online, you know, it's, there's so much information out there these days. You know, when I was first starting in my career, I did not have access to the range of information we now have with all the houseplant keen experts, enthusiasts online, on social media. This love, this love of plants was something that I was always kind of a bit ashamed about when I was younger and now kind of all everybody's into it even you guys and i'm kind of like you know this was i tried to tell you all this was so cool you know 20 years ago but no one listened but suddenly now i seem to be the cool kid finally yeah, yeah. <laughs> well so you, you, your website mentions that you were a shy child and i've heard you oh, mention that in other interviews i guess yeah i was i was not confident but my outlet was obviously plants so I was hiding away at the weekends, kind of working on my, my parents' garden, obviously my grandparents' garden as well, just kind of indulging. And I remember I would just spend hours and hours just in the potting shed, you know, sowing seeds, all of that. And also selling the plants at the local WI market. So I was kind of in this little protected bubble, protected by foliage, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so that's a safe bubble. That was kind of mm -hmm. odd. And it kind of carried on into my teenage years. And I was never really the cool kid. Um, do you know the film Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I would describe myself and my friend at school as being Romeo and Michelle because we, we were not the cool kids. But at the same time, we weren't the awful kids. We were somewhere kind of off to the side, just doing our own thing, having our own version of fun, but not being seen as popular or worthwhile. So that kind of explains a lot and i relate so much to that film and yeah. so kind of through my teenage years yeah i was just growing plants it it almost came unstuck when i was working on the school garden because that was then at the front of the school so everybody saw us working on it when they walked into school so it was like my cover was suddenly blown and people knew i wasn't you know wasn't in the remotest bit cool so that wasn't so good but yeah did you get any like, back from that was that sorry? additional hazing or something after that Hazing. Oh. <laughs> Such an American term. We don't oh, have really? hazing. <laughs> I guess but, um, people are just nicer than we are. 
<laughs> but I've watched some videos online that start with hazing, but I think that's a whole other story, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a genre of its own. <laughs> <laughs> now we pretend um, we don't know what that means. Okay, what? what? Yeah. So, yeah, I was um, teenage years, yeah, kind of not bullied, but just kind of a bit kind of ostracized, really. I also wasn't that confident with my voice. When I was in my teenage years, my voice was kind of, I think it kind of didn't break properly or it was kind of some weird squeaky little voice. And so that was kind of a point that I could be bullied from. But I actually devised this really cool way of just avoiding all the stuff where I needed to use it. So like, you know, speaking out in French class would have been a nightmare for me. So I was I was kind of like developing my own uh, kind of like playing hooky from school kind of program. So I was mm -hmm. going off myself to the park kind of. It was really odd because I was doing it all in a solitary way, but stuff that you'd usually do as a group. So I kind of, I don't know, I was just hanging in the park, kind of experimenting with smoking, but realizing that I wasn't very good at doing the the breathing and stuff. And I held the <laughs> cigarette far too camp. So that didn't work. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was kind of just years and years of like avoidance, really, and not really feeling like anyone else. And, and the refuge was my plants, obviously. So, yeah, I got to the end of school and ended up, I think because of my confidence, I wasn't very good at ever planning ahead and kind of thinking what I could do next. So I kind of just fell in to go into a horticultural college, which kind of in those days in the UK was almost like the kind of catch all. Like if they didn't know what to do with you, they kind of sent you to Hort College. So kind of not sure if that's good or not, but there, it was just a, a course of like 12 other students and it was almost there I finally found my people and I found my feet and I then started to feel more confident and um, it was probably a year after that that kind of like I had some like vocal training kind of like my voice sorted itself out as well so it's kind of like suddenly I don't know like you've been in a box and then yeah it's like oh this is cool other people that like the same things as me and yeah that's where it suddenly then started to feel a little bit better I would say so yeah Hmm. So, so where, where in this process did you come out? Mm. This was uh, during college. Sorry. Oh yeah, it's it's a very dramatic pause. Yeah. When... <laughs> <laughs> Pretzel pause. It's, right there. it's not until you do a podcast interview that you realize how chewy pretzels are. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. At least <laughs> you had a soft one. Ours are yeah. crunchy. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Matthew beforehand. I'm like, eat up now. Okay. Yeah. yeah right. So pretzel is gone. Now I can fully relax. Honestly, sometimes I'm such a pig. If there's any food in sight, I have to eat it before I can relax. It's like, get it. I get understand. It. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Understand so where did too. I come yeah. out? I was at college. College was cool. It was kind of, I don't know, it was kind of a little bit weird because I was in college for, it was a two year course. I remember having some work experience with a garden designer who was uh, working locally and he was kind of like a very well not well known but well known in the right circles kind of quite rich kind of working with a lot of big houses kind of that sort of stuff and I was being taken to a lot of really cool things and kind of like seeing the designs and you know spending time with you know sometimes lords and ladies and not not quite really knowing what that was about but kind of like realizing kind of like later in life that that was kind of a <laughs> I don't want to say like grooming sounds like a really strong word because it's not like anything yeah. ever happened yeah but it's kind of was, yeah but I think kind of like he was I used to re remember doing his filing and there was some very kind of like strange kind of like letters between him and his like wife of convenience and and I think he'd always been kind of like maybe a little bit gay but like kind of in in his kind of like world it wasn't really acceptable that he would come out so there was like little things that happened on the side and mm -hmm. and I think that he was kind of he he obviously saw something in me and was kind of gently I guess trying to encourage that out or kind of like then to spend time with him and kind of maybe he saw what he could have been in me and stuff like that so I think that kind of was even though nothing happened it was kind of highlighting to me that kind of all right, there's kind of gay things that happen out there and kind of this is how it works. And yeah, so that was that. So that didn't lead to me coming out, but that was the first time I really kind of 
embrace the thoughts in my mind, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Um, I was only kind of 18, 19. And this is when the internet came along. So you remember yep. when the internet was like dial up and like your parents were like, get off the internet, you know, blah, blah, Absolutely. blah. Absolutely. They yeah. needed the phone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and in the UK, we, we had AOL was the first provider. And so yeah. I remember being set up on AOL and then kind of like wandering into various chat rooms and kind of still kind of like testing the ground on that sort of stuff. Um, and then... I think the first few things that happened was randomly with a guy on the college course who's now kind of straight, you know, nothing, nothing really happened in that direction permanently. But I guess when people are younger, they just kind of experiment and stuff. And then kind of the couple of years after, I guess I just started to meet guys here and there and then met a guy called James that kind of like was then my first boyfriend for maybe about two years. And we like moved in together, bought a house. And I actually came out during that relationship. So I think sometimes it's almost your first relationship that kind of encourages you to come out. So yeah, he gave me a yeah. lot of support in kind of coming out to my mom. And yeah, so I think if I hadn't been in a relationship, it probably wouldn't have happened. And I think for parents, it's much more tangible to see, to understand you're gay when you're in a relationship. I think for parents to look at their son as being a single gay man, is a, there's a lot more fear involved mm -hmm. in that than there is yeah. kind of you being sitting there in a relationship this is kind of a bit more solid so yeah yeah so it kind of worked okay i remember there was a super awkward conversation with my mum though and and <laughs> and i really <sighs> and i just couldn't say it so she was like we were going through a process of elimination so it was like is it the job is it this is it that is it that and then like she finally <laughs> said is it like you're gay or something it was like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, yeah, it was really strange. And and it was, I don't know, sometimes my mum is, like, really annoying because you, she'll agree to something at the time and then two days later she'll be, like, you know, ringing you up. It's like, well, actually. And so it yep. was just like that with the gay thing. So she was like, oh, no, that's fine, that's fine. And then two days later she's, like, you know, having a tantrum about it. So it was like, oh. Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah, but think... that was how it happened. I was just 21, so that was my age. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, and you know, I think, you know, there's pieces in there like you just have to find your people, right? It sounds like that mm. happened, if, you know, in a few ways, maybe gardens and, you know, a gay community of sorts, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think that's... And timing. Timing is a lot of it as well. Yeah. That's true. What is it like being out as a public person then? We weren't sure if you, you know, came out after you had kind of had this more public persona. Um, does that mm. affect your brand, though? Or are there any considerations with that, like traveling internationally or... No, I mean, I came out when I was 21 and I didn't, I mean, I didn't really have a public persona, I guess, until my late 20s, I suppose. Yeah, because I was, I was working in Thompson & Morgan, kind of just behind the scenes, new product development, you know, introducing the new plants. And it wasn't until, you know, late 20s that I was then being pushed to do various different TV things and kind of, and even now, I don't know, with the internet age, at what stage you really can class someone as being a public persona because surely to be a public persona you'd have to walk down the street and at least one person out of 10 recognize you i don't know what is the <laughs> i don't know what that's right way of measuring this doesn't there yeah so <laughs> do you get recognized in public no not really i mean if i'm in a gardening context it is much more likely so if i'm like you know hanging around a garden center waiting to be recognized, then yeah, it'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, oh, sorry, what was your question? Oh yeah, the coming out. Um, yeah, so I have, I started to set up social media accounts, I guess in my late twenties, when it was then the point where I was doing a bit more TV, kind of starting to document a bit more of my work with the product development as well. And I don't remember ever making a choice that, oh, I won't talk about being gay or that I would talk about being gay. So it's just kind of all the way along. It's just been incidental, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I would never hide it. But at the same time, I don't need to kind of endlessly point it out to people. I think that is the way that's most comfortable to me and most comfortable to people and the way that it should be, really. I don't know, because it's, yeah, it's like you're a, you're a plant expert. You're not a gay plant expert. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I've never really kind of thought, oh, it's, it's my mission to kind of make it look like this or do that. But I guess the way I am quite kind of, I don't know, ambivalent about it almost is kind of quite a nice example to set to people, I suppose. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. really just, just lead with visibility and keep the focus yeah, on yeah. Yeah, but not even not even forcing it. Just that's it's just incidental. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I guess right. I'm almost having an epiphany now on this living room chair. That kind of yeah, it's just that's just how it happened, and it feels nice, really. Yeah. That's great. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Might need another pretzel after that epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So amongst plant gays, and mm -hmm. you just said you know uh, we're not gay gardeners. We're gardeners, or but. Mm. Among those gay gardeners, is there anything different in, in your mind in the way we approach plants or gardening? We take our shirts off. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see that on Instagram all the time. That's right. Much more often we pick up a potted plant and sit down and put it on our laps, right? Yeah. Um, do you know what? It's... This yeah, is a it's tough one. I think about, yeah, this is a this is a massive. Question. We're th we're Sorry. just throwing you in whatever this is. I'm not even pausing for pretzel this time. I'm actually pausing to think for a change. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's amazing because I don't know. Kind of like gay men. There tends to be more gay men that are interested in plants, but it's almost helped people as a way of connecting. And I think instagram in particular and social media has been a gods a godsend for people like me and people that are interested in plants because finally we could find a way of reaching out to other people who've got that niche interest because you know until now we were not plants and gardening were not mainstream at all you know so that's why I always i'm like you know i spent bloody 25 years kind of hoping that everyone would love plants and now they do sometimes i don't know what to do with that i'm kind of like what I told you so you know it's like what what do I do now yeah and so yeah so kind of that community feeling has really helped and yeah I just hope that people aren't liking plants just to make themselves popular <laughs> <laughs> but it's almost become like um kind of like a dating almost like um not grinder but it's almost like grower do you know what I mean like people yeah. are connecting yeah. through kind of plants and kind of that like gay world has really embraced plants i guess because it's about that kind of feminine side of stuff and whilst gardening is not necessarily feminine like straight guys you know i observe straight guys all the time and they seem to be so bound by their own masculinity that it's kind of such a shame because they would probably love to embrace plants and gardening but it's just society doesn't let them or their own restraints don't let them you know it was i was this is a little bit off subject but I was at a big dinner last week here in China with a lot of the expat community and there was kind of like like a group of kind of like five kind of coolish guys at the other end of the table and they're all drinking beer and I'm kind of looking at them and I'm thinking like the probability is that five of those don't want to drink beer like maybe one of those fancies a gin or a glass of wine but in the masculine world it's really hard to be yourself so it's almost like it's like the straight guys have less freedom than actually like the gay guys, which is kind of weird because you'd think that we were the ones that were kind of struggling to kind of get what we want to have. But I think sometimes we have to realize that we're, we're doing well because we kind of like carve our own path rather than mm -hmm. have to drink a beer with the guys at the end of the table. So I hope that tangent really helps to answer the question. Yeah. It's, it's really strange because... I feel like I'm taking a long time to kind of go through my thoughts here, but I've got to tell you guys, like, this is the first time I've actually done a podcast that openly talks about kind of sexuality and plants. A lot of this stuff, I'm probably only kind of processing it in my mind for the first time. So you guys have almost got an exclusive with this, you know? First time oh, that that's I've talked about I how sexuality is linked to plants. So you know right from when you asked me to do the interview you know we always want to have a slightly different angle on each one and and you know you've heard my story so many times on other podcasts so it's really nice to take it down that different route and talk about stuff that i've never touched on before so it's yeah i really appreciate that guys oh great really to hear that. that you were open yeah. to having that conversation yeah definitely that, that we've kind of talked about on our show is that there is so much ornamental value to plants mm -hmm. that i've always assumed that maybe 
gaze in their decorating. Maybe that has something to do with it. I know that I use plants as decor readily. There's a lot mm-hmm. to explore there about the mm-hmm. gay interest. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think the straights probably want to decorate, but they're too scared to because their mates aren't. Yeah. yeah. Imagine if a straight guy <laughs> just started decorating. <laughs> yeah. So, what's it like with a partner who isn't into plants? Is there any positive part of that? I think, like, um, you don't have to have a partner that's into the same things, really, because I think if you are, it's probably a little bit too intense, and then your world is only one thing. And, like, he's really into technology, so I really like that, because, you know, I learn about things, or, um, you know, I embrace things that I never would imagine that, I would even grab hold of because I don't feel very techy at all. So, yeah, so that is really nice. And I think he obviously appreciates kind of, you know, going to like natural places and and it usually kind of like blurs with the technology. So if we're then going to, you know, somewhere to see plants, then he's probably bringing, you know, some cool 3D camera or the drone or something. So it's kind of that that blend of the two. So that works really well. He's obviously helped me with a lot of the branding when I set up the Mr. Plant Geek brand as well. So that has worked really well because he's into tech, but he's actually works as a designer. So it's kind of all of that combined into one. So I think it's actually quite a surprisingly nice duo, really. And in all honesty, I don't know if I would want a plant obsessed partner, really. Yeah, I was thinking like you're possessive of the window space, right? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, because... Yeah, I don't think you need it really because you've obviously got different outlets where you then share that sort of thing anyway. Like you don't you don't get everything you need from your partner necessarily. You know, you don't have all those shared interests. But I love the challenge of having different interests because to me it's very easy to like the same thing all the time. But I love to be suddenly, I don't know, like watching films. I love to suddenly be shown a film that I wouldn't imagine I'd want to watch. But, and I usually enjoy it. You know, you just need to be pushed into that. So, yeah, yeah those, I think being refreshingly different is nice, to be honest. Talking about those Hayes movies. Yeah, 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 those yeah. ones. <laughs> I wonder how many people know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> a section of our listeners, for sure. It's a su- subset, maybe, yeah. yeah. Hey, as as someone with a partner who is not into plants either, either, it is really interesting to watch how my fiance approaches plants because he thinks it's really cute like the care and attention that i give them and i try to like (laughs) share some of the interesting things that i feel like he might get something out of but do you find that yourself that you get to see him taking in a new hobby to a level that he would have never considered i guess so yeah but i'm not sure it's so much a hobby of or just you know helping to care for them I don't sure. know. Like, <laughs> but he does have a reminder on his phone to like water every week. And yeah, I mean, I think when you're really disinterested in plants, it's very hard to appreciate them in the in the way that we do and kind of mm-hmm. give the care in that way. And also, you know, sometimes when I come back, I'll see, you know, stuff has got yellow leaves or kind of like this bit's dying. And it's kind of like, how did you not notice that? But then to me, like something technical. Like, I don't, like this, right, I've got a really strange example. Above me right now is a lamp. We have a lamp over the table, the dining room table. It has four different settings, yeah? Uh-huh. You're, you're, think, you're thinking like, what is this tangent again? <laughs> There's four different settings. Just before Rafael went to work today, I was all ready for the podcast and I put it on a setting and I didn't even think like, just it's just the lamp. To me, it's just the lamp, yeah? Just like to him, a plant is just a plant. Uh-huh. So like the lamp is on and he's kind of like, he comes along, he's like, Oh, and he changes it because apparently I had it on too blue a color that made it look like an operating table. What? <laughs> so, so, I mean, that means nothing to me. And then yeah. he changed it to one that's wow. more orange and more comfortable. And he would feel very different being under that light to this light. Whereas, like, you know, the plant, if this plant to my side had yellow leaves, he wouldn't see that. So it's it's that kind of blindness to what you're not, you know, what is not naturally interesting to you. You just don't see it. So... It's kind mm-hmm. of really, it's funny, isn't it? It's really, but I think yeah. that's the best example to give you there. <laughs> we're all interested in the things we're interested in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We're refreshing your store length. Yeah. <laughs> so if we could end on a geeky note, amongst geeks here, 
do you have any plant life highlights? And, you know, so often you're democratizing and explaining to people who are approaching it kind of at all different levels. But yeah, any any kind of geeky things that, you know, maybe you can't always share that people won't always get, but we will. Oh, about caring for plants or yeah, caring, caring for plants. plants or, you know, maybe you've seen something super cool or you've achieved something in your growing that geeks would Got appreciate. It. I see super cool stuff all the time. It's like, I just love it. I'm really into moss at the moment, actually. <laughs> oh, cool. non Did you see recently? I experimented. Um, I did a hotel room installation in London. I saw you did, had Jane yeah. Perot there. Was yes, it that one? Yes, she was. She was. Okay. And I experimented with making up a living moss rug. So mm -hmm. it was just an installation. So it's just kind of short term. But we made it on a cork base. And it lasted out for about five, six weeks was the time that we needed it on display. And yeah, and so you could kind of like lay on it, you could rest your feet on it. And this was like a living moss rug. So wow. that was a kind of cool, different experiment. Uh, what else did we do through there? We also found some really cool containers for bathroom walls, which mm. you could then put as suction onto the tiles because it's quite hard to fit stuff up onto bathroom walls, isn't it? Rather than drilling something. So that was that was pretty cool um stuff that i love to do actually it's more kind of outdoor stuff but a lot of the work i do in japan is with outdoor containers i work for an english garden called barakura and we do a lot of containers mixing different categories of plants so it'll almost like like look like an english country garden but in miniature because we'll be using kind of small trees kind of bedding plants kind of really packing everything in and there I've learned a lot of new methods that I haven't learned off anyone. I've just kind of been thinking laterally. Is that the right way? I'm not sure if that's the right phrase or not, but like just kind horizontally. Of like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but just kind of looking around at different materials and kind of like changing up how I do things. So I made some containers like when I was there a couple of months ago and I dressed them with dried flowers. So it then gave a slightly different effect to what you already had there. So I'm, Always yeah. obsessed with kind of mixing up what you usually see there. So obviously here I've got my houseplant cuttings in vases, but every so often I'll just poke, you know, fresh flowers into it. And so I'm just always about being creative with plants, really. You know, when you're on holiday in like Bali or Malaysia, they often put like hibiscus flowers around in the in the toilets or on the sinks or on the kind of worktops. Mm -hmm. I kind of did that in my bathroom yesterday. I just randomly put some flowers around the sink and it suddenly got that feeling like you're on holiday. So kind of, I'm just always wanting to experiment with plants and use them in different ways. And did that give you a takeaway tip? I'm not sure. My takeaway tip would be yeah. always water plants from below. There you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's where I knew it was going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been so rapidly today. I'm so sorry, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's been fun. So oh. are there plants that you've seen either growing like wild or just out in somebody's garden unexpectedly that were amazing to see outside of a home? Oh, God, all the time. I mean, we were in Seychelles for holiday a month ago. You know, in the wild, you know, you've got Gloriosa lily just randomly just twining itself through a hedgerow and not just normal one the lutea the yellow one so it's just oh, wow. it's just there and i'm just i'm just staring at it kind of like you know fangirling and i'm just kind of like how are you there <laughs> <laughs> and it's just growing there and it's just casual and it's like oh my god this is amazing and then um what was it in the hotel grounds fair enough it was planted but it was still an amazing plant was the the cannonball tree which is the one with these massive, massive fruits that have a putrid fragrance when they ripen. Mm -hmm. But the flowers have a very fragrant, um, uh, fragrant fragrance. What do you call it? A lovely perfume yeah. <laughs> when they're first uh, opening as well. So this is an amazing tree. I would say, yeah, largest seed in the world, Coco de Mer in Seychelles, in Borneo, seeing the Reflacia. I mean, everywhere, like even yesterday in a Chinese plant shop, seeing this variegated banana, the Musa AA, was just, wow. oh my gosh, you look at my Insta feed, it's just an amazing Oh yeah, plant. I saw it. It is And really it's just cool. casually there, and I just, and sometimes, like non-plant people don't quite get it, but I'll just see an amazing plant, and I'll just, I'll just freeze. I'm just like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh my God. And in China at the moment, there's a lot of pink flowered trees, in the streets so you're seeing a lot of bohemia but also teresia which have got gorgeous gorgeous flowers oh. so i'm seeing good plants all the time and 
And that's what kind of keeps my interest. Whenever I'm walking somewhere, I'm always just looking at the plants all around me. So it, it, I always have to bargain about 50% more time to walk anywhere because I'll be stopping, looking, <laughs> taking pictures. So, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember um, doing some running a few years ago. I'm not really into running that much, but we were doing some like, yeah, circuits around the block. And the only reason I did it is because we would run past this lovely rose bed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> did you get that? You need to just tempt sometimes? me with flowers and plants all the time. <laughs> well, that sounds doable. Yeah, yeah, it's the only way to get me somewhere. <laughs> Perfect. We'll just promise you some plants if you're ever in Seattle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's really a pleasure to talk to you. This is a really fun conversation. Yeah. yeah thank you so cool. much for yeah. taking the time. No worries. Thank you, though. Thank you for the yeah. opportunity and enjoy your time there. I'm very jealous of what you're describing. No problem. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no blue lights, right? <laughs> Careful. Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, cool. See you later, bye. guys. Bye. All right, bye. bye. Okay, so I had a lot of fun chatting with Michael as he ate yeah. a pretzel, and I was eating some hard-ass little pretzels, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my like, late afternoon snack and his breakfast. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from our conversation, Stephen? So for me, I think it was great to hear about another, you know, former shy kid who followed things he was interested in and was really successful, right? Kind of at different stages, mm -hmm. just following these, you know, things he thought were cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that really speaks to kind of what you and I are doing now on some level, right? Yeah. Just kind of going with this whole podcast thing. And we just started it one day and now we're just keep doing it for whatever reason, but just because we like it. Yeah. He like did that with a mail order herb catalog. Yeah. Um, um, also, uh, Torch Ginger. Uh, I'd never heard of that before. Super cool. Uh, uh, yeah, so right. I'm going to kind of seek that out. Um, you were saying, you know, we probably can't grow that indoors, but maybe it's at some garden or something, and maybe I've walked past it. Who knows? I mean, it is a flower, right? Yeah, so you, maybe you probably I've have seen, seen it, it somewhere. Really? Okay. If they're not in bloom, they look like any other tropical foliage plant, mm -hmm. basically. It's in the ginger family, the ginger borales. That uh, you can now say. Yeah, since the episode that we talked about Clathia <laughs> right. and the Marantas, where I could not say their family name, mm -hmm. um, I have looked into keeping this plant. They get so damn big that there is really no way to do this unless you have a tall conservatory. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you better believe that I would have one. I think yeah. that they're fantastic. And I kind of like that he specifically named them as one of his favorites. So how about takeaways for you, Matthew? Um, you know... Honestly, there were kind of two. The first one, I would not have expected this. And I think it's so cute that he names his plants. Like the fact that there's <laughs> Francesca the fiddle leaf fig. So he currently has Alice the Alocasia, Peter the Pothos, and Agnetha the Aglanema. Okay. So, I mean, <laughs> I personally don't really name my plants, but I do have Brian name some of them sometimes. Really? Because that way it like makes him feel a little bit more tied into them, perhaps. Like, what has a name? Uh, I think that he named the Clathia Musaica, and I don't remember the name because I didn't name it. Okay. I'm just trying to get him to care a little <laughs> bit. And right. Mike Johnson from Gayish Podcast doesn't care about plants, but he does care about Josh, the yucca tree in the oh, living room that right. his roommate Chris had him name. So I was kind okay. of taking a page out of the Gayish notebook for that one. Okay, all right. Um, but my other takeaway about chatting with Michael was... Just the idea of the world kind of sucks sometimes for some people. In fact, for a lot of people can identify with this. And plants are a great way out of that. It gives you an outlet. It gives you an interest. It's a way to kind of find yourself in the world and to find your community and, you know, your plant mm -hmm. family. And he has done such an amazing job of doing that for himself personally and also encouraging that in others. I think that plants as therapy and as like a mental well-being practice is mm -hmm. really a beautiful thing and he just champions that so way to go i think that's fantastic yeah it's great yeah yeah okay, he was nice. also super super friendly and super open with us so yeah. thanks again michael it was great having you on yeah. anything else you want to add steven that's it y'all should go get some pretzels yeah, okay. because if this didn't inspire you. Yeah, pretzels, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this has been Plant Daddy Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you enjoy what you've heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends. 
If you ever want to be in touch with us, perhaps with a question, email us at plantdaddypodcast at gmail.com or check out our social media on which we can be found as Plant Daddy Podcast. We're looking forward to you tuning in next time. So thank you for listening and happy growing. Thanks a lot. Check out Michael Perry on social media as well. Plant Geek. Mr. Plant Geek. Plant Geek.